Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by former Syracuse basketball player Leo Routens. Routens played at Syracuse from 1980 to 1983. Listen in as Leo shares stories about the two other schools he picked before coming to Syracuse. Spending the night in the hospital two days before his memorable tip-in that won the 1981 Big East Tournament, and his lovable dogs, Summer, Cooper, and Charlotte, plus Rico the Cat. Leo, how are you? I'm great, Mike. Good to see you. Good to talk to you here. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Uh, we talk occasionally, but uh, it's it's been a little while. Um, and I know you're right in the middle of an NBA season, uh, you know, still doing your television commentary on Raptors broadcast. How's that going for you this season with, with COVID and everything going on still? Oh, uh, it's interesting. You know, this is my 26th year and uh, there's not, a, there hasn't been a year like it. Uh, it's been, uh, it's definitely been interesting. You know, we did the bubble uh, and, and I've done a lot of broadcasts throughout the years where, you know, you're not there. So for example, international games, things like that. Uh, and you miss a lot of the nuances, right? You miss, you can't hear the officials. You can't hear the coaches. You can't hear the players talking trash and all that. Um, but probably the biggest thing you miss is when you're hanging around the court and you know, this is a journalist, when you're hanging around that court, the two and a half hours before the game, I mean, you get enough information to do 10 games worth. You can't, you can never use it all. Um, not having that, I mean, we still communicate, you still call people and this and that, but not having that access every day um, is, is different. It's definitely different. It makes you, you have to put in a little bit more work. <laughs> well, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I'm definitely going through that covering Syracuse this year. It's, uh, you know, when you can't go to practice, um, even if you can go to a home game, but you don't even get to talk to players before or after, it's all on Zoom. It's just not the same. Well, you know what it does is uh, it gives you context, right? Uh, whatever you write or whatever I say, it gives you context. You 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 can put things in the right frame and the right perspective because you know a lot more than you're actually telling. Uh, and, and I think that's great for the viewer. It, it allows you to be, uh, I think, much more professional at, at what we do uh, if you have that context. And some of that's being taken away, which uh, which I don't think it's good for anybody. But that's our life right now, and you know, it's uh, everybody's making sacrifices, and that's uh, one of ours. Yeah, and hopefully we muddle through it and get back to normal soon. But, um, you know, it's interesting. You're, you're in your hometown of Toronto uh, yeah. when, when you're doing the Raptors broadcast. This is not a team you played for. Uh, this is your hometown. I mean, what's it like, you know, being back in, in the city where you grew up? Uh, it's pretty cool, actually, because uh, before the Raptors started, once I left Toronto, I, I really didn't have a kind of a connection because – there was nothing for me to do as far as work. There was no basketball here, really. Uh, and that's, you know, I was, I was doing ESPN, as you know, college hoops and other stuff. Um, so when the Raptors came into being, it, it was phenomenal to have the opportunity to come back. And, you know, my dream was to play for a Toronto NBA team. And for a while there, it looked like it was going to happen. Uh, Ted Stepien, remember, he owned the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah. Uh, he talked about he wanted to bring a team to Toronto. And he even ran into me one day before I was drafted. Uh, and he said, hey, when I get a team, you're my first guy. I'm taking you. So, I, like, I was really excited. But, you know, obviously it never happened. So to be able to come here uh, as a broadcaster to do the TV and kind of, um, you know, I forgot how great a city this is. Uh, it, it's a phenomenal city. And, and to come back and spend so much time and, and, and be here and then basketball being a, a big part of the – the city and the whole, really the whole uh, country, the landscape has changed so much here. So it's been pretty cool to be, to be a part of all that again. You know, Canada is producing a lot of really great basketball players now, you know, the names that are in the NBA, you know, from Jamal Murray, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other guys that are out there, Andrew Wiggins, and it's just a whole host of them have come out of Canada lately. Yeah. RJ Barrett, I guess is, is another one with the Knicks, but back in your day, you know, I think it's interesting to think about how you got into basketball coming out of Toronto. And I think it's important to remind people that your family, you're, you're Lithuanian. That's right. And Lithuanians yeah. play basketball. <laughs> well, that's really it, right? Uh, I had a big brother, as you know, and, and, and he was kind of my driving force. I'd be better than him. 
and he played basketball. But the only reason any of us played basketball is the fact that we were Lithuanian and uh, we were raised in a Lithuanian community in Toronto and all the Lithuanian kids play basketball. I mean, it's a national sport in Lithuania. So we actually had a church uh, that was all, you know, could always go to the church and play. Uh, so you always had pickup ball and you had priests that came from the States that knew basketball. So you had, you had actually had a priest that was a coach that pro- may have played NCAA hoops or something. So your, your, your exposure to the game was very unique, very different from being up here. Um, and that really like, that was, that was kind of when everybody was playing hockey, uh, I played hockey like everybody else, but I yeah. also had that basketball outlet. Right. And, and so I was hooping every day too. And then when my brother, my brother ended up getting a scholarship, was drafted by the Buffalo Braves and p- played for Canada. So whatever he did, I was going to do a hundred times better. That was, that was it. That was, that was my driving force. But uh, being Lithuanian certainly was, uh, was impactful. And, it, and as you said, it's just unbelievable to see where, how the game has grown. Right now, Canada is the most NBA players outside of the United States in the NBA. And that number is not going down. That number is growing up. I think there's over, I think there's over 150 uh, kids playing in the NCAA. And before it used to be like, you know, I was kind of a rarity and you had a few guys here and there. Um, but not many of us had, had big roles with teams, right? Mm-hmm. Or were main players. Now you got guys that are main characters with teams all over the place, including the NBA. Uh, so it's really changing. And, and I'll tell you what, Mike, when the Raptors won the championship in 2019, because because the NBA changed all that for Canada. When they came to Canada in 95, as an example, Andrew Wiggins was born in 1995, first year of the NBA here. And he grew up with it. I mean, I rarely saw NBA on TV. So when I was saying I want to be in the NBA, it's kind of like, huh, what are you talking about? But now kids, kids can watch 300 games a year. They can go to camps, clinics. They can do everything. Um, so it's realistic to say, hey, I, this is something I'd like to do. So, you know, look at all these guys that are in the NBA now. They really were the, were the byproduct of the NBA coming here. And when the Raptors won the championship in, in 2019, over half the country watched the championship, over half. And the diversity and the multicultural nature of Canada, uh, you know, it, it suits the game, right? It suits the game. And, and uh, it, it, it's welcoming. The game is welcoming. And whatever we saw being spawned from 95, we're not even going to begin to know what 2019 meant for a few years down the road, but it's going to, it's going to make it even bigger and better. Wow. How good were you at hockey as a kid? Could you play? Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty good. Um, I had one problem though. Uh, I, I had, uh, I had back surgery when I was 11. And I was actually playing up, uh, up levels, which, in, you know, in Toronto or in Canada, if you're playing up a little bit, you got to be pretty good. Right. Um, but once I had back surgery, they said, uh, nope, that's it. You're done. No more getting crashed into the boards or anything like that. So uh, that pushed me all the way into hoops. You did a story on your back issues. It's been a lifelong battle with that back. That back surgery you had as a kid. That was serious. I remember you telling me that the, the doctor told your parents at the time that you might never play sports again. Or never walk. Uh, they didn't know what was going to happen coming out of surgery. So, and unfortunately I was young and stupid and I didn't pay any attention to that. I just knew that after the surgery, I could start doing things again, even though nobody knew I was doing it. Um, and eventually my parents didn't try to stop me because uh, I was doing okay. But yeah, it's been a, you know, when I had the surgery a year ago, a year ago, February, um, and the lead up into that was kind of crazy, even for me, because everybody, and I had some top medical people, everybody that looked at my MRIs and, and looked at the history, go, how did you play? Like, I had guys like, you know, like I said, some top people looking at my MRI going, oh, Jesus, oh, God, oh, I go, okay, stop, I get it, it's bad, right? <laughs> it, it was, it was scary. Um but they all said, like, how did, how did, like, one doc, the guy that did my surgery, Dr. Dan Cohen in Miami, he even said, like, how are you walking into my office? Right. And then my wife's going, could you tell him, could you tell him to stop working out every day and stop walking every day? I go, he's going, hey, whatever he's doing, he, I can't believe he's even walking in here. So let him keep doing whatever he's doing. Um, so it might be what's it, saving him. Yeah, but I, I tell you, it was, it was an eerie, eerie feeling because it's almost like I, I cheated the game. Uh, somehow, I was able to have a career uh, and accomplish things that uh, 
sorry, I got uh, uh, some call came in, coming through here. But, uh, you know, something somehow I, I was uh, able to cheat the game and do something maybe I shouldn't have been able to do. And and it's kind of an odd feeling that you have this whole life built around something that maybe shouldn't have happened. Because uh, I guarantee you now, if, uh, if, if they did the physical testing and all the things they do for NBA players uh, back then, mm-hmm. I would never have played. I mean, nobody would have let me ever play. Uh, even get a scholarship probably wouldn't have happened. So, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of – it's a blessing, but it's also like a kind of a, an odd – an odd feeling when you when you really think about it yeah really. you know what else you know talk about things that might not have happened if things had gone a different direction you ended up at Syracuse after going to another school initially Minnesota and you committed to another school when you transferred from Minnesota you committed to Marshall now yep. why didn't things work out at Minnesota first of all well I mean they, they could have I could have stayed there and in some ways had a, had a, as good, if not better career uh, at Minnesota. Um, but you know, there were academic issues, discipline issues, all kinds of things that, you know, one thing I want to do is if I'm going to be in school, I'm going to leave with a degree, right. I'm going to leave with a diploma. And now that, that was like, they almost looked at you like you were an idiot for wanting to go to class. So um, eventually I just, okay, enough of this. Uh, and like I said, there was discipline within the program that uh, it was, it was a bandit program, right at that time. And then, uh, so then you, when you transfer, you want something really positive. Uh, I it came down to Syracuse and Minnesota. Then I came down to Syracuse and Marshall. Um, and there was a Canadian coach at Marshall, actually Stu Aberdeen mm-hmm. and, uh, Stu, uh, you know, it was going to be my program in a nutshell. It was going to be, everything was going to be built around me. And, uh, it's the same school Mike D'Antoni went to Marshall and, uh, that's kind of a cool thing, right? And because uh, for a while there, I was, I was thinking, because I, I had a lot of experience playing in Europe with the Canadian national team. For a while there, I was thinking, okay, I'm just going to go to Europe and play. I'm not even going to finish. But then my dad finally said, what are you, an idiot? That's okay. All right, got it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and it was kind of funny because Bernie, you know, it came down to Syracuse and Marshall and, 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 and Bernie called me. He goes, are you, I told him, I'm just going to go visit Marshall, check it out. And then I came back and I said, uh, Bernie, I got to talk to you. He drove from Syracuse to Toronto in three hours, right? You know, no- normally, normally that's, a, that's a, you know, good solid four hours minimum. And, uh, and we had a conversation. And one of the things he said, well, what about his, what about his health? I go, you know, I said, Bernie, that's bullshit. Are you telling me that Stu Aberdeen is going to drop dead when I go to Marshall? I mean, come on, man. You've been cool with all this recruiting thing. This is second time around. How can you say something like that? And three weeks later, uh, Stu Aberdeen passed away from a heart attack. And uh, so, again, I, I, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to go. I'm just going to go to Italy. We just got back from a tour uh, with the Canadian team in Italy, and I had some offers. So I said, I'm just going to go to Italy. And then, again, my dad kind of slapped me around, told me I was an idiot. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, I, I literally – got into my house from coming back from a tour and, and coach Beheim and Bernie were on the phone saying, Hey, we're still here. And that's how I ended up at Syracuse. Now, you know, some people aren't going to know the name Stu Aberdeen. I know yeah. him because my dad worked at the university of Tennessee back in the sixties and seventies. And Stu was Ray Mears, assistant at Tennessee. Ernie and Bernie. Right. He recruited Ernie Grunfeld and Bernard King. And before that, he was responsible for some of the development of big guys like Tom Borwinkle, who played with the Chicago yeah. Bulls, uh, another yeah. seven-footer, Len Cosmo. But, yes, yeah, Stu Aberdeen was this little guy, bald head, glasses. Yeah. He did not look like a basketball coach. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and, he was a, and he's a great recruiter. And, and he convinced me that he was going to build around me. And the recruits that he got coming in with me, mm-hmm. uh, I, I was convinced that we were going to have a – we're going to have a great team and uh, it would be my team. And again, we know we are transferring. You're kind of looking for, for something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but like I said, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it never happened. And, uh, and like I said, I can't complain the way it worked out. It worked out pretty good. <laughs> it did work out good. You had three excellent years. Um, although there were some ups and downs. Two and a quarter. Uh, Two and a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> a quarter. Well, your your first year playing at Syracuse would have been a redshirt sophomore year. 
Yeah. You were actually starting until Coach Beheim pulled you out of the starting lineup midway through the year, right? Yeah, I was bad. I mean, uh, a couple of things, you know, sitting out, it really hurt me. Um, I never sat out before. I never did not play competitively before. I was playing with the national team since high school. I'm playing, you know, whatever. I, I Even in high school, I played 75. I played 100 games. I played at a high school team, men's leagues team, Lithuanian team. Like, I just played and played and played. So that year off really hurt me. Um uh, and and then there was a, a boycott as well. So when I would have been playing in Olympics going into my first year at Syracuse, I didn't play. So uh, that was really hard. And then and Coach and I – You were going to be on the Canadian Olympic team in 1980 for those Olympics yeah. in Montreal? Uh, no, that was in – 76 was Montreal. Uh, the Olympics were uh, – I think – were they in Russia, I think? Oh, yeah. I don't know where, where they were supposed to be. But the United yeah. States boycotted, Canada boycotted. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And, so you got uh, robbed and, of an Olympic opportunity. Yeah, and we had a great team. But that was one of our we, – we tied for first in the pre-Olympics to go. Uh, and and that that was one of Canada's best teams, and we never got a chance to, chance to play. But for me personally, it, it affected me because, again, what I was normally used to, and after, after, after redshirting, that would have been to give me the opportunity to really get back into it, right? And, and it didn't happen. So – I wasn't that good. And, and, you know, coach wanted, everybody wanted me to lift, get stronger. And I was playing as a power forward. And I remember when I was in Minnesota, I was second in the big 10 in the system, Magic Johnson, I was playing point guard. So all of a sudden, you know, and to make a long story short, I finally, you know, told coach and said, I'll give you what you want. I'll play power forward. I'll rebound. I'll guard big guys. But if I don't have the ball in my hands, I can't play. And, and eventually that we kind of worked all that out. And, uh, and despite all the rough spots, uh, and, you know, and my knee was bothering me, all kinds of things. And then we, by the end of the season, after he benched me, I just said, I just said one thing to coach. I said, coach, I get it. I benched me too. I, I suck. You know, all I'm asking you is give me a chance to come back in. If you give me a chance to work my way back in, that's all I can ask. And, uh, and uh, so he said, he, he said, okay. And, and I, and I just had a different attitude. Uh, our second group did, we kicked everybody's rear end in practice, never lost a, a game, a scrimmage in practice. And I just worked my way back and we ended up uh, finishing strong, winning the Big East championship in Syracuse. Uh, and then going to, we, we got snubbed because the Big East didn't have an automatic bid at the time. And we should have, well, I can't say we should have went to the tournament because we sucked all year except for the end. Um, but we, we, we played great in the, in the NIT, and we ended up losing in the championship game to Tulsa, uh, which we got – we had three Big Ten referees, and uh, I think we had four guys file out of that game. So uh, Tulsa had a little bit of help in my mind, but yeah, it's like – but it was a great run, right? And yep. so my life at Syracuse changed. You know, that – 1981 Big East Tournament, of course, it's held at Syracuse at the Carry Dome, right? Yeah. And you guys win. And, you know, everybody remembers one thing about that tournament, and that's your tip in to win the championship game in the third overtime against Villanova. But yep. I think the untold story, or it's only been told occasionally, because I mean, I know you spent a night in the infirmary after yeah. your first round win over St. John's, right? You were yeah. hurt. Yeah, that was kind of the beginning of the end of other physical problems it's now my knees. Right. So what happened is, you know, we, we played St. John's opening game of the tournament. Yeah. And like I said, at that Syracuse uh, and remember had there Wayne McCoy at center and Wayne McCoy came barreling down the lane. I got in front of him and I'll never forget. He looked me right in the eye. It's almost, it, it, this remember old school ball was okay. okay you're there. All right. You're going to remember this one. And I knew I'm, I'm dead. Right. So I take the charge. He slams into me and he came down on my leg. And what we didn't know at the time was I tore my ACL. Right. We didn't know that. Um, so I go now it wasn't completely snapped. It was torn. Uh, and so, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't straighten my leg, bend my leg. It was it was really bad. Fin I finished the game. I went to the Don Lowe, our trainer at the time, took me to the infirmary on campus. I literally spent the night there. They kept icing my knee, moving it, doing whatever they had to do all night long. 
uh, tried to get a little sleep. Uh, then Don treated me at the, at the dome during the day, uh, tried to get a little sleep before the game. And then we played Georgetown and I didn't know if I could play, but I, I, I tell you what, Don Lowe was a miracle worker somehow between massages, rubs, ice baths, you name it. Uh, he got my leg, uh, you know, good enough to play. And so we played, we beat Georgetown. And this time I just went home and uh, I, I iced all night at home and repeated the whole thing again. And we beat Villanova. And, uh, and but you know, I, I tell you, it, it, it's, it's kind of crazy because we had that NIT run and my knee was sore and my knee was not good. Uh, and then as soon as the season ended, I ended up having surgery and, and, and being put in a cast and all that kind of stuff. So that was the beginning of that journey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now he's got, now he's got bad knees and a bad back, but he's going to make the NBA, you know? Yep. 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 <laughs> you, did. you were a first round draft pick mm -hmm. back when they apparently yeah. did not do any medical. <laughs> you know, Hey, it's funny story. You know what my, okay. So um, I got an idea that uh, Washington, I think they were around seven. Uh, I forget who was around 10. Um, uh, see Sixers at 17, Portland at 15, San Antonio at 19. Those are the teams that were interested. Mm -hmm. And so my agent calls me, says, uh, morning, the day before the draft, my agent called me, the Sixers want you to come in. And so I go, I, okay. So I, I get to the airport. This is hilarious. I get to the airport. I look up, flight to Philadelphia canceled. I go, no, can't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow they rewrite it, rerouted me and I, and I got to Philadelphia. So first thing is you got to get the physical. Okay. I go in, I sit down at his doctor's table. He bends my knee. How's that feel? I says, good. All right. You're good. <laughs> that was my physical. Like today you're, you're, they're going to do blood tests. They're going to do body MRIs. They're going to do scans. They're going to bends my knee. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then, uh, I go into a meeting and I got, I got Harold Katz, the owner, Jack McMahon, one of the coaches and scouts, Matty Gukas coach, Billy Cunningham coach. Uh, oh, I mean, it was like Pat Williams, the GM, like nine, 10 people in there. And they're just boom, 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 questions and everything. But I left there feeling pretty good. I said, I aced this thing, right? I end up meeting my agent, Bill Pollock, at the airport. Uh, he was flying. So he says, hey, Brett Arbach just called me. He goes, they want to try to move up, uh, move up to get you. Now, backstory, the year before, my junior year, we're at the Big East Tournament in Hartford, and we lose to Boston College in the first game. But I'm just coming off of knee surgery, another knee story, and, and uh, there was question whether I'd play or not, but I played and I had like, you know, I don't know, I had a big game, we lose at the buzzer, but Jack Donahue, our coach from our Canadian national team, was good friends with Red Arback and a lot of NBA people. He was sitting with Red Arback during that game. And Red Arback told, told coach that if I come out, he'll take me. Right. So uh, Boston Celtics were a team that I loved. So I really started thinking, and especially with my health, I go, maybe, maybe I should, you know, maybe I should do this. But there was no guarantees, right? If, you, if I came out, and Boston, Boston would have a late pick in the first round because they're always one of the top teams. If they didn't take me, uh, you could be screwed, right? So right. Uh, it was too much of a risk. So I came back. And, and so now we're at the airport in Philadelphia. And my agent says, Red Arback's trying to get you. And I go, oh, that would be fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, he, he said that they – he kept calling me. He said they can't move up. They can't get there. Um, so then I was hoping uh, – I really liked uh, – I really liked Portland. I liked the way they played. And San Antonio was perfect for my style. I mean, they just run up and down the whole bit. Uh, but, and, and the Sixers just won the championship. So it, it ended up, and I knew that if uh, Clyde Drexler, uh, he was the guy that was always with, in my, my conversation. And I knew if, uh, if, uh, if, if, Clyde's, if, if Portland could take Clyde, they'll take Clyde. If the Sixers could take Clyde, they'll take Clyde. So it ended up Portland took them and I ended up with Philly. Wow. Wow. You know, we've been going along here and we have fun talking uh, basketball and hoops and stuff, but I want to ask you about some other neat things. Uh, if anybody follows Leo on Twitter, they, they know of two things. They know from last summer, they know all about twine and wine. 
when, when you started doing all these trick shots in your pool down in Florida yeah. Yeah. while you were recovering from back surgery. And, and, but also they know about your dogs, your family. Yeah. The two, uh, two Leon burgers, Cooper and summer. Yeah. And then Charlotte. Oh, yeah. Charlotte's Cooper there. summer and, and Charlotte's right here is my girl right here. Right? Oh, What's man. Up, Char? Say hi. Say hi, say hi, say hi. Hey, hey, hey. She's not interested. She wants to go back to sleep. <laughs> and, and she Sorry. dominates those big Leons, right? Oh yeah, they're terrified of her. They are terrified of her. But it's a it's a pretty cool collection. We have a have a cat here somewhere too, Rico. Well, uh, doesn't Rico rule the house? Like of, with all those dogs in the house, isn't she in charge? Yeah. Well, Charlotte Charlotte's kind of the the bossy one, right? Rico's the one you kind of don't mess with. Okay. Uh, Summer the the leon burger she's she's definitely the boss like when she finally says enough i cut the cut the crap cut this crap stops right and then uh, cooper's a monster he's uh last time i weighed him he's 160 pounds he's still got about six more months to grow and uh he's just like a, a big happy goof right so it's uh it's an interesting collection of animals i'll tell you that I tell you what, I, the, the pictures of them are awesome, but I can't imagine <laughs> the, the the hair uh, clean. <laughs> it's not that bad, well, you know. Like, okay, my wife would tell you a little different, but you know, <laughs> if you if you brush them regularly, which that's my responsibility, I had to make all kinds of deals to get these dogs. Uh, and then uh, in our home in Florida, we got that what are those Roombas or whatever that's always going right. And then uh, and then for all of you dog people out there, you'll know what I'm talking about. You get the Dyson animal. <laughs> right that, that, i i vacuum i'm in charge of that too so i'll vacuum uh twice a day i mean you can do your whole house in five minutes with, with that thing so uh i'm uh you know uh i'm in charge so i keep the hair you know uh under control <laughs> hey that's the price you pay for having those big dogs right oh man it's uh yeah i had i had a, I had a fight hard for the second for cooper uh because jamie said hey that's enough man that's, that's enough Everything's good right now, and then uh, she could have killed me because when we did get him, when he when he when he arrived, uh, we were in the midst of the championship run for the Toronto Raptors, and so I wasn't home for two and a half months uh, while she gets the new puppy. Oh, and no. uh, yeah, oh. there were plenty of calls going. I'm sending your dog away. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. That's great. I, before I let you go, I want to ask you about two other things. Um, you know, you were a transfer to Syracuse. Uh, we talked about it earlier from Minnesota. And back then, you know, Syracuse didn't get a lot of transfers. But yep. it seems like lately, from Michael Benege to Elijah Hughes, and this year, Alan Griffin from Illinois, um, you know, I guess not too long ago, you had Wes Johnson and Ryan Blackwell. Is this just part of the changing landscape of college basketball, or do you think this is a, a changing of Jim Beheim's approach, a combination? Um, of two? Well, it's a combination, right? Because you know, Jim Beheim, you don't survive and be as successful as he has been um, without adapting and being flexible. And, and, and Jim, Jim is a great coach, uh, and he's a great uh, reader of talent. Uh, Jim knows guys that are going to fit into a system. He knows. He can see it. And remember, one thing with transfers, there's no guessing. You know what you're getting, right? Um, you know, a player, for the most part, is, has been somewhere else. You get to see him in the environment that you're going to want to see him in. Uh, and you get a pretty good, even a better idea of who that player is. And then the player also has a little bit more maturity, right? I mean, you're sitting out, you're a year older. Um, you know, all these kids come in so young, and all the expectation is there. These kids are being coddled and everybody told you, telling them how good they are. And all of a sudden, you know, when you've got to actually coach them, it's hard. Whereas if a guy transfers, he's already kind of been through some experiences, which uh, now, okay, you're not as pampered right now. Now you figured out this is real. Uh, so you get a little bit more grounded uh, athlete, I think. So, mm -hmm. and the pressure's there to win, right? The pressure's there to win. So if you can find those guys that, could come in, sit out. And that sitting out process, like it was hard for me uh, just based on the nature of what it was like back then and what I had to do to be me. But, uh, you know, that year where you're practicing, you get to know everything, you get comfortable with the landscape, you figure out the school, uh, you get settled in, in the classroom. Uh, so it's not that bad a thing. 
transfers used to be looked at bad in my era because, you know, guys are problems, right? Mm-hmm. This guy's a problem. People don't look at a transfer that way. You know, the, you look at the transfer list right now for the NCAA, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, right now, uh, Jim Beheim's son, Buddy, is on the basketball team here. I was wondering if there's any similarities between, you know, having you know him having his son on the team or what it was maybe like for you when Andy came to Syracuse and Andy played here. Um, I mean, obviously you weren't coaching him, but that father-son dynamic at, at alma mater. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you and I have talked about I was nervous, right, When because uh, I kept telling Andy, are you sure you want to do this? Because – you know, one, you're going to hear about me all the time. Whatever you do, people are going to bring up my name. And, and that's not fair to you. But Andy's always been cool about that. He goes, hey, I don't mind. I like it, right? It's, you know, you and I, you and me, like we always had this connection. So uh, he was always cool about that. So that was one hurdle. Um, but, you know, Syracuse is a tough crowd. And they've always been tough on local kids. Uh, mm-hmm. For some reason, they're, 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 you know, like I said, it's kind of like a pro crowd. And it's not really fair how, how they've reacted to something some of the kids. So I was really worried, uh, but almost from day one, uh, they accepted them. Right. And the crowd was, the crowd really responded well. Uh, and Andy, Andy had a pretty good idea, you know, you know, coach, I mean, coach, coach can get into your grill a little bit. And, uh, and I used to tell Andy, like, I, you know, uh, yeah, are you ready for that? Right. And he says, I got it. So he knew what he was getting into, right. He knew, he knew what, the situation was going to be like, and I'll never forget one time. I think it was his sophomore year. I'm I'm on a road somewhere and I'm watching Syracuse play, and coach takes him out. Coach is getting into him, and Andy's saying, "And I after the game, I called. I said, are you okay?'" He goes, "Yeah, I'm good. I'm just so mad at myself. I'm an idiot." I go, "You're not mad at coach, right? You're mad at yourself." I so he, you know, he's you know he Andy Andy figured out that whole thing. So uh, yeah, it, it's. Uh, it is, it is, like I said, I coached Andy too. So it's a, uh, I think it, it's uh, maybe easier to watch uh, your son play in that environment than to coach him. I, and, but the one, it, so you got to remember the dynamic too. When I coached Andy for Canada, I hadn't been a head coach before, right? Um, and I didn't have a record, mm-hmm. right? So people look at things in a lot of different ways. For example, I had, I had, I had, we had to kind of stretch and find ways to win and, you know, if I give if I give a, this player some slack, knowing his background, knowing this and knowing that this is a, OK, we got to grow this player. I, I, if I cut him a little slack, nobody looks at it cross eyed. Right. If I cut my son a little slack, it's a whole different perception. Right. Like there were days that we walk into practice. And go, I said, Andy, I'm going to rip you a new one today. He goes, for what? I said, just shut up and take it. Right. Because <laughs> everybody had to see that. Right. <laughs> so there's there's uh, yeah, it, it's not it wasn't really fair to him. Uh, but that's the reality of it. Now, the difference for Buddy and Coach, Jim Bayham's one of the most successful coaches in the, in the history of the NCAA. So, you know, if, if he's going to coach uh, his son, he's going to coach his son. And you really can't question what he's doing. So I, I remember Doc Rivers, when Doc Rivers' son uh, went to the Clippers when he was coaching there. Uh, one of the first things, I, I, you know, Doc's a friend of mine. I said, Doc, have fun with this. Enjoy this. Because guess what? You're a champion. You're an NBA champion. No one can question you as a coach. So enjoy the opportunity to spend this time and have this relationship with your son. Um, and I, and I hope Jim, I hope Jim's doing that too. Uh, but uh, hard to tell. Cause it's huh? <laughs> hard to tell. <laughs> well, you know, and, and that's a good thing. If it's hard to tell, it's good. That means he's doing it right. I mean, if, <laughs> if you could, it, seriously, if you could tell the, if you could tell he's having just a wonderful time coaching the son, you'd know that, you know, he's coaching, right? His son is one of his guys, but obviously, you know, the relationship is there and he knows his son and, you know, how you deal with things uh, away from there. I know, I know Jamie, when I was coaching, she goes, if Andy calls me one more time and if you bitch about him one more time. <laughs> so, you know, we had, uh, you know, we had some interesting experiences, but at the same time, I remember one time, I think we were in Italy and we're standing there for the national anthem. And just by chance, I look over Andy's right next to me. Mm-hmm. And I just said to him, so this is pretty freaking cool, isn't it? Like we're, we're doing this together. We're traveling around the world, playing ball, you know. Uh, so uh, it's, it's great memories. And uh, like I said, I, I hope uh, I hope for Coach that, uh, you know, this is – he's going to – it's going to be a great memory for both of them. It really will. 
Well, Leo, listen, I could sit here and talk to you and ask you questions and listen to your stories all day. Uh, but uh, I know you're a busy man and you got things to do and you got you got Raptors games to prepare for. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for, for stopping by and, and joining the podcast. I appreciate that, Mike. I so said we've always had uh, always had a lot of fun talking hoops and uh, always great to, to reconnect with Syracuse. So many great memories uh, and a lot of friends there. So, uh, you know, and we even have a blizzard in Toronto, so it almost feels like Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> all right man hey listen you be good and stay well okay all the best and everybody stay safe as well please